We now need to investigate the mail server. We have a guest account on the mail server. However, the only information we can gather from it is a contact list of employees and emails, which we can use for phishing, of course. And there are different tools out there. I'm just going to, I'm going to pause this and just show you guys a real world tool that I found really interesting. If I can remember kind of where I did it, was it Harvester? Gosh, come on one note quit failing me there's there's a cool tool is it british credentials no that's not what we're doing discovering email addresses this is what i was thinking of so if you were doing a phishing attack which obviously i don't recommend like don't actually do a phishing attack on a company but if you are a pen tester or just want a proof of concept to understand how some of this works Let's, I think hunter.io is a decent website. And I want to show you how an attacker would do this. So if we do a company like nsa.gov, they're probably going to come after me right now. Um, you'll notice that we, <laughs> Edward Snowden, that's cool. Um, it's going to kind of go through the internet and web scrape and see what we can find for that. If you create a free account, you can see we can now cover email addresses. They're some of these are free. Let's try phonebook.cz. Yeah, let's try this. So um, it gives us some examples. So we can do netflix.com and submit. And look at that. We have all these probably valid emails that we can then use this. Maybe if we find a directory online, we can use this as part of a phishing attack. There's other websites that can verify if the email is legit. So right here, you can verify email addresses discovered to verify that they are valid without interacting with the person or company you are verifying. And I bet you could probably use an API and put um, that list in like a text file and write a script. And then you have like, here are the valid emails. You could use these emails to maybe look through LinkedIn and do other open source intelligence to plan a phishing attack. Uh, so that's just how easy it is to harvest emails for phishing attacks. Just showing that what we're doing here is realistic. Um, these are real methods used by attackers. Okay. With a list of emails, we can send out a phishing campaign to see if any employees execute a malicious payload. Phishing overview. I don't, I, th I think you probably know what phishing is. So we'll just kind of skim through this. Uh, phishing is a broad topic, brief look, attaching an EXE to an email, granting us a reverse shell. There's actually a zero day out right now. And once again, I'll show you guys a real example of this. I think, yes, yeah, so we have, we have a work, work around for this. You can look this up yourself, but it's a, zero day vulnerability that can use malicious like word documents that you don't even have to like enable macros or anything by simply opening the word document it's a one click phishing attack that you can then execute something malicious on the user so once again this is real world stuff um grandness reverse cell this can be done using ms of msf venom to create the payload i'm sure we'll talk more about that as the course goes on as well as with other tools along with ms F venom to obfuscate the payload. That's just to make the payload. So you can't tell that it's a payload that can sometimes evade different antivirus detection, depending on how they detect it. Identifying targets before we send out phishing emails, we first need to identify our targets since we have a specific goal in mind. This is what spear phishing technically is. We want to target employees that throw back hacks. Uh, we can find employees from the contact list of the guest account that we compromised earlier. When enumerating web servers, we can also send emails from the guest account. And if we look at that production server, we can take the emails we found, compare them to the team on the production server, and then we know how we can target each individual. Payloads 101. The Metasploit framework is a massive suite of tools that we're only going to scratch a surface of with this course. In this section, we're going to focus on generating payloads using MSF Venom. But before we dive into generating payloads, we need to learn a little more about the types of payloads. Staged and stageless payloads, differentiating between staged and stageless, ah, staged and stageless payloads can be difficult at first. It sounds and seems really complex until you learn the difference between the two. So let's dive into them. Staged payloads require a handler to catch the payload and send the appropriate response back to the server to trigger your reverse shell. 
stageless payloads do not require any specific handler, right? So that's the difference between the two. A reverse shell can be caught with a utility like Netcat, SoCat, or many others. Difference in stage versus stageless payloads. Telling the difference between stage and stageless payload in MSF Venom is relatively trivial. First, you need to list all the available payload with MSF Venom using one of the following commands. And let's just go ahead and follow along. The output can be overwhelming. MSF Venom has upwards of 500 plus payloads that you can utilize. Piping the command into grep and narrowing down your search by operating system can majorly reduce the amount. So let's go ahead and do this because I can already tell this is taking a while. So MSF Venom dash L for list payloads and grep, which is essentially like finding if you remember we're doing PowerShell, it's kind of like piping. It's a little bit different, but it's similar in the essence that we're taking the output of this grep. We're searching through that output to find something specific for this. We're going to grep windows because that's the OS that the workstations are going to be on that we're targeting tail dash n dot 20, I think is going to show the last 20, I think. And apparently it's going to take some time. So let's just keep reading while that does its thing. And the screenshot above, you notice two similar looking payloads. Windows X64 shell reverse TCP. X64 is of course the architecture reverse TCP. It did it right here. Spawn a pipe command shell. There it's staged, right? So if you remember, the stage is what requires a handler. Uh, connect back to the attacker. Then we have this one that looks almost identical. Windows X64 uh, shell underscore reverse underscore TCP. Connect back to attacker and spawn a command shell so this be a stageless. There's a minor difference between the two. Whoops. The top payloads is stage payload as stated by the description, but Metasploit also has a naming convention. The top payload has three slashes. One, two, three which indicate it's a stage payload. Didn't know that. That's why it's going to read through stuff even if you think you know what you're talking about. The bottom payload, which is stageless, has two slashes. Additionally, the bottom payload has two underscores while the top payload only has one. If you notice that. Knowing Metasploit's naming convention on stage versus stageless payload, we already know we will be using the Windows Meterpreter Reverse TCP payload. So that has two. So if we follow kind of that reasoning, the two is going to be a stageless one, right? If we follow that reasoning or stage, I don't know. Um, to generate a payload before we should take the time to verify. We can do this by listing MSF Venom's payload and grep for the prior mentioned payload. So let's go ahead and just follow along with the guide. MSF Venom dash L for list payloads. And there's that grep command I talked about. We're looking for a string. Windows, Meterpreter, Reverse, Underscore, TCP. And it should pull it out for us. Okay, confirming Windows, blah, blah, is a staged payload. The description does not indeed indicate that it is a staged payload. I don't know why mine's taking so long. After we generate the payload, we'll set up our handler that will be used to catch our shell. So we can do like we did for the reverse shell. We can set up a netcat handler to do that. Here it is. Inject the interpreter server DL via the payload stage, blah, blah, blah. Okay. All interpreter payloads will require a handler no matter what. Which payload where? So far, stageless payloads sound like the best payloads to use for any given task, right? Well, no, that's not always the case. Stageless payloads by design are larger. They're larger, so keep that in mind. Stageless equals larger because they contain everything required to land a reverse shell back on your box in a nice and neat style. This can be a disadvantage for several reasons, which are reasons that you would want to use a stage payload for. There are several reasons you might want to use a stage payload. For example, Number one, you could use it when you're limited on space in a SEH-based buffer overflow or stack-based buffer overflow 
Buffer overflows just confuse me. We'll just throw that out there. Maybe we'll get some practice. You could use it in conjunction with antivirus evasion techniques to sleep for a given period of time to escape a sandbox and malware scans that might detect your payload. Interesting. Afterwards, reach out to your handler for the rest of the payload. Additionally, you can also use stage payloads to gain additional functionality within your shell like Meterpreter and is the, the biggest reason that you would want to use a stage payload. Note, even with some stageless payloads, to get certain features like Meterpreter to work, you will need a handler. Because remember, they said any Meterpreter shell is going to need a handler. If you're going to set up a handler anyways, you might as well make it a stage payload, right? Right. Generating payloads. In this portion of the course, we will be using a stage interpreter payload due to its additional functionality. In order to generate our payload, we can use MSF Venom with dash P to select our payload followed by L host. That's going to be our IP, our listening host variable and an L port. That's the port we're listening on. So if you remember our PHP shell that we did before, similar thinking. Remember, we set our IP in that PHP shell in the port we wanted 1337, that example in that pay shell or in the PHP reverse shell to tell MSF Venom what interface and port to listen on. Lastly, we'll follow up with the .f flag to tell MSF Venom what format we would like the shell code to be in. We will be using exe for this example. Um, I believe you can even use like PDF or different things like that to make it. If you're doing a true phishing email, most people aren't going to open a .exe or for the zero day, a .docx, you know, a word file. Putting this all together, we can get a nice command that looks like so. All right, well, let's go ahead and see if we can do that. MSF Venom dash P for payload. We're specifying the payload that we worked on. TCP L host. Um, we could probably use ton zero. Let's double check. Yep, we could. Okay, cool. And I should just point out what I was looking at. Um, this is the IP we need. And we have it there. So we'll follow along. Zero L port. Now the reason it has 53 is that's going to be a common port. So it could be used for firewall evasion. Meterpreter often defaults to the port 4444. And if you look at just standard firewall rules, they will often block that port because it's a known port for exploitation. So it's always good practice to use a common port. Now you can't evade what's called a layer seven firewall this way because a layer seven firewall, it's following the OSI layer, which means the firewall is application aware. Even if you're using like port 53 or port 80 to make it look like HTTP traffic, the firewall actually looks into that traffic and says, hey, these aren't standard get requests and it's gonna be blocked, okay? So this won't evade all firewalls, but it will evade firewalls that are not like that layer seven firewall. L port 53 dash F for our format is exe dash O is going to be how we want it to output. And of course we'll call it not a shell dot exe because you know, obviously you'd click that, right? Because I'm, I'm telling you it's not a shell. It may take a few moments for the payload to generate. After it's finished, you'll receive some statistics about the generated payload. Congratulations. You've successfully generated a payload. We haven't yet because it's still loading. Next up is getting your handler set up to catch the payload. Metasploit. Now let's just see. There we have it. Not a shell.exe. Clearly no one would ever recognize that that is a reverse shell. We, we're, we're definitely going to trick them in our phishing attack. Metasploit makes setting up handlers incredibly easy. Now I will just note, um, I... I know Nate is as well studying for the OSCP and you're limited on what you can use Metasploit for. I don't know if you can use it to catch a payload. Nate, you can confirm or deny that. I know in the OSCP generally you can use Metasploit once. You can pick one box to use Metasploit on and everything else has to be manual enumeration. But our handler could just as easily be an NCAT listener and it should accomplish the same thing, but you'd be limited because it wouldn't be a full interpreter shell, but you could still catch this payload. Um, Nate can confirm or decline in the chat and if or when he does. Okay. So Nate said you can use multi handler to catch shells if I remember right. Can only use exploit for Metasploit once. Okay. That makes sense. Metasploit makes setting up handlers incredibly easy. After generating your payload, we need to spin up MSF console. So the way that you launch Metasploit is by typing MSF console. 
take a drink of water. I've been talking a lot. We're an hour and eight minutes into the stream, my friends. We got 20 minutes or so left. So we'll see how far we get. Um, but like I said, for those of you watching, the four of you, thanks for being on here. Or those of you watching on YouTube after the fact, uh, I can't promise every night, but I would say most of the time I will be streaming on Twitch from 10.30 p.m. to midnight central time. I'm already studying at that time, so I figured I might as well stream what I'm learning on my own, and maybe you'll learn something and, and join with me. So we need to spin up MSF Council, use an exploit, next in the asset, blah, 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 blah. And it actually shows everything that we're using here. I want to show you guys, before we do this, I want to show you a little bit about how uh, Metasploit works. So Metasploit is, as it sounds, a program used for hacking. You can exploit known vulnerabilities this way. You can actually look them up by their CVE. You can look them up by the program. So for example, I'm just trying to think of like Apache, for example. We can search Apache and it's gonna pull up the different vulnerabilities. I'm gonna full screen this because it will look a little neater or it should. Let me shut again. Yeah, so if we look through Apache, you'll notice it, it puts it in different categories. So we have exploits, we have scanners here, um, but if you know like the Apache version, you can look up at what is it vulnerable to. And then if we want to use, just kind of looking through here, we can just pick a random one. Um, hey, there's log for shell, that's a popular one. So let's go ahead and that was 83. So you would do use 83. And then you can check your options and it's gonna tell you everything that it needs. So for this one, we need the HTTP header to inject into, the method, the port, um, the R host, that's going to be the IP that we're attacking. The port that we're attacking server host is often the one on your attack machine to listen on the local port to listen on here. We have the L host L port to set up a, sh a reverse shell through Java. So I'm not going to go too deep into uh, Metasploit, but I will say if you're on try hack me, I believe they have an entire module dedicated to Metasploit that walks you through how to use mod Metasploit, how to set up different payloads, how to go through these different things. But for now, let's go back to just following our room right here and pull this up and let's go ahead and just give ourselves a little more room on our Kali Linux box. So we're going to use exploit multi handler make this a little clearer. So if we look at options here, you're going to see the options that we're going to set. Um, but we also need to set the payload. So we already checked the payload before when we were grepping through stuff. So let's go ahead and set our payload for windows, interpreter, reverse TCP. And then let's set our L port. So this is what I was saying. If you remember what I said before, interpreter often uses port four, 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 four for the L port. And we need to match, as, as we're setting this up, we need to match what we specified and the payload that we set earlier. So if I remember right, in our payload, we set the L port to 53, set L host to ton zero. And now we're gonna exploit dash J. Let me just clear this out. Let's check our options one more time. Make sure we have everything right. And now what this is doing is it's doing the same thing our netcat listener did before. It's just going to be listening. And then what it's listening for, we're listening for our victim to run our not a shell.exe. And when they run that shell, what should happen is it should connect back to this um, handler to catch that shell. And then we have pwned them. That's how it's supposed to work anyways. So exploit. So there we go, we started it. This is our attack IP and we're on port 53. So catching some fish, let's create our phishing email. All right, creating effective phishing email may appear daunting at first. Um, and let's just be real. If you ever look at your phishing emails, I should pull up one of my old emails and we can look at a legit phishing email. There's such bad grammar. Um, everything's terrible. <laughs> But every once in a while, if it's a targeted phishing email, they can get pretty advanced. Creating an effective phishing email may appear daunting at first. However, 
we'll see that this requires only a cursory understanding of social engineering and the basics of business email composition, and might I suggest the basics of English grammar. Consider this, we have two goals with phishing attacks. Goal one, stay under our target's radar, such as that the email does not come across as suspicious, and two, prompt our target into action through either filling out some form or through the execution of our payload. And I've seen this in the real world where uh, when I worked in IT support, people would forward emails to me that were supposed to phishing emails. Many of them actually were. And it'd be like a Google form, like, hey, to access this document, type in your username and password in a Google form, but people actually fell for it. This requires us to write an email that has the following. Number one, correct grammar and punctuation. Thank you. Uh, prompts a user to action. Uh, three sets a deadline for action. We we want to make it urgent, like do this now or this dire consequence is going to happen and make sense within the business context. Here's a brief example of what might constitute an effective phishing email. Hey, everyone, we're releasing an update for our note-taking software in order to keep using the software. So we have this, like, it, it makes sense in the business world to do this. In order to keep using the software, this is time specific. You must, you must perform this update prior to next Friday. Please run the attached file, not a shell.exe, to this email to complete this action. Thank you for your patience in this update, IT support. Note how we accomplish our goals in providing a situation wherein the email not only makes sense to our target, but also prompts them into action with a set deadline. If you successfully created a payload and send out a convincing email, enough email, you may get lucky and an employee will click on your attachment and execute your payload. Sending phishing emails to all employees that throw back hacks and wait a couple minutes to see if you get back a shell. Okay, so let's first back up here and let's log in as one of the users that we compromised to make it even more believable. Um, let's, I, if I remember it asked about the Murphy F guy, so Murphy F in summer 2020, let's go ahead and log in as Murphy F summer 2020 and look at that. Um, just click through this stuff. Please open the file attached below in order to carry out essential vulnerability updates. That's funny. So is this, is this from another user on the network? I mean, the date's wrong from, from guess. So this is someone trying to do a phishing campaign, right? And they have the vulnerability update.exe here. That's cool. Um, let's just jump back on to look through a few of these and we have a password reset notification. Dear Frank Murphy, due to the recent firing of the TimeKeep developer who had access to our database, we have decided to issue a password reset. You can do so by replacing username. So um, I just want you guys to look at this. The password reset was sent on August of 10 of 2020. That's of course summertime and this password is summer 2020. That's why if you are a system admin, you need to enforce password complexity and you can actually there, there's different things you can download i think no before has this where you can connect it to your active directory and they'll actually scan through your active directory hashes and compare them to compromised hashes and tell you which users are using compromised passwords so um some cool stuff that you can do there let's jump back we are going to want to send out our phishing email so let's go ahead and do that let's compose or actually let's go to addresses can we Oh, our address book is empty. Are we supposed to do this from guest? I mean, it'd be more convincing if we did it from an actual user, but guest had everybody in the email address and I don't feel like um, typing in their name. So we're gonna log back in as guest, but if this is a real world situation and you had compromised people's emails, you definitely would want to use their emails and not guest. This is also another reason why multi-factor authentication is so important. If you're at a company, you may get annoyed that when you log into your email or other applications, you have to pull your phone out because you have Microsoft Authenticator or whatever, and you have to confirm the login. This is why that's important. Passwords are easily compromised, but if you have that second layer of defense, um, it's gonna help prevent that. So that even if your password is compromised, an attacker cannot log into your email because you're gonna receive that multi-factor authentication. Now there's ways to bypass that. One way is social engineering, right? So if I'm talking to Nate, for example, and let's pretend like Nate doesn't know anything about computers and I call him and I'm like, hey, Nate, uh, this is so-and-so, 
once again, social engineering, figuring out a name from, this is John from the IT support department. We are troubleshooting some stuff with your email. In just a few minutes, you're going to receive a prompt on your phone. Hey, can you just do me a favor and confirm that for me? Oh, you can? Okay, sweet. Thank you. I appreciate it. So you can use social engineering, among other things, to bypass multi-factor authentication, but it is kind of just a standard you should have in place. If your company doesn't do that now, you are just asking for trouble. So let's go ahead and go to our addresses. Let's get all of our people and let's do compose to. Let's call this subject uh, check out Tyler's Twitch <laughs> stream. It's awesome. Obviously, that does not actually fit the phishing email, but hi everyone. I recently came across this incredible streamer. He does a great job at providing cybersecurity aware the cybersecurity awareness training. Please open the attached file to automatically I think it's follow follow his Twitch stream so you can watch his next stream. Thanks. IT support. Okay. I think that sounds like a good phishing email. Um, now what we need to do is of course, attach our not a shell shell. And that was in throwback mail, not a shell. Do I need to hit attach afterwards? Yep. Okay. So, hey everyone, I recently came across this incredible streamer. He does a great job of providing cybersecurity awareness training. Please open the attached file to automatically follow his Twitch stream so you can watch his next stream. Thanks, IT support. Send. Okay. Um, let's see if it went through. That it did. We have it right there. Has the attachment. Let's jump back to this. Uh, did we miss anything here? If you six your preload, send out, send out convincing enough email, you may get lucky, blah, blah, blah. What user was compromised via phishing? Uh, I don't know. Uh, so this is running, right? Yeah. Okay. I never use exploit dash J. I don't know what dash J dot does. Usually if you just run exploit, it keeps running here. Um, I thought maybe it opened a session. Oh, it runs as background job zero. Um, how do I even check that? Hey, Nate, how do you check that? <laughs> Usually I just do exploit. I don't really know what the dash J tag does, but we're going to find out. Oh, it just does jobs. Okay. Gotcha. Oh, dude, you're a genius. So if we do job zero, does that allow us to connect to it? Oh, let's see. How do we connect to our interpreter? Okay, here we go. Displays and manages jobs, right? Which is if we just type jobs, we got that. Jobs just run, you can't connect. Okay, gotcha. Oh, so there we go. We're getting a connection right there. So a user clicked our not a shell.exe. And we should get a interpreter se session one open. So here's where the sessions come in place. This is what I was trying to do initially. Oh, we are root. Oh, maybe they're a local admin on their account. So if we type shell, I thought we'd, Oh, here, here's our, 
Here's our information right there. Blair J was our person compromised. What machine was compromised during phishing? And we can see we're at workstation one. Throwback workstation 01. And look at that. It is 1151. I honestly think this is probably a good stopping point. And I'm just gonna glance ahead at this one. Oh yeah. Okay. Um, although it's not quite midnight, I think this is a good spot to stop. Let's go to our sessions one. LS, okay. Is there any, I bet there's some flags we can grab real quick before we call it a day. What is the flag from the poison user on throwback.prod? So now we could we could keep it at Meterpreter or we could drop into a shell. I'm gonna drop into a shell just show you guys how that works. Meterpreter is more powerful. We drop into a shell. Now we're in a Windows shell, right? So we could do dir, and I'm guessing it might be, I think they often put the flags on their desktop or documents, I don't remember. There it is, so if we cat root, no, it's not cat, it's uh, type root.txt and Windows, if I remember right. We have a flag right there. Let's grab that. Oh, one of these is a flag. <laughs> oh, hold up. I was looking at throwback production. We haven't, we haven't done that yet. So what is the user flag? What is the root flag? Here's what we found is that right there. What is the user flag on throwback WS01? We're already root. So I don't know. Let's go back to C users what other users do we have here we have fox r horseman b i don't know let's just look at a few of these not that one not that one one of these has to have it, right? Hey. And type is just like the Windows equivalent of cat. If you're wondering why I'm doing type. If you don't work in the command shell much for Windows. Okay, I think those are the two flags for compromising that workstation. So we're going to call it a night, y'all. Thank you for joining me. For those of you watching on YouTube, thank you for watching on YouTube. Um, I encourage you to catch me uh, next time live for this stream. Once again, I will be streaming most of the time from 10.30 p.m. to midnight. Hopefully next time I won't spend the first 30 minutes troubleshooting why the throwback network isn't working. But as you can see, just to recap kind of what we've done, we got that web shell again. We got some information from being root on the firewall. And uh, we ended up pivoting over to the mail server. We used Hydra, remember, to essentially get do password spraying. And we compromised, I think, around five users through password spraying. And then we created a, a payload with MSF Venom. It did a phishing email campaign. We compromised a user who happened to be root. And then we used that as our pivot point to go through that. We had our interpreter. We dropped down into shell and then we grabbed these flags. So we will start up at task 13 tomorrow. And I will catch you guys then. For those of you on YouTube, I'm going to stop recording. And now for those of you on Twitch, I'm just going to pull up the chat before I disconnect with you guys. Um, thanks for joining. Special thank you to Nate for hanging along and helping me <laughs> as we work our way through this. And my plan is to, let's see, what day is it tomorrow? Thursday. I think I'll probably be live tomorrow. Um, pretty sure I will be. So if I'm not live at 1030, I'm not going to be, but I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm free again tomorrow night. So I'll likely be back on Twitch at 1030 tomorrow night, and we will keep working our way through the throwback network. And I will catch you guys then.